Church of Ireland, 50 years, was saying that one of the good things, and it would be nice to think that there was a good thing, that came out of these two te uh, terrible uh, events was an ecumenism in the town of Wexford and gave the example of the fact that, I know it's not visible from here, but trust me, about a couple of hundred meters from here is a Franciscan monastery. Now, they came here in the 1300s and are obviously still here. But about 50 years ago, they found out that they had dry rot in the roof of their church and they couldn't afford to repair it. So they announced to the people of the town that after all these hundreds of years, they would now have to go and live in another Franciscan monastery because they couldn't just pay the bill. And the people of the town said, no, 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 we will find the money. We'll pay for it. And they did to repair the roof of the friary. But the friar said, but while all of this is happening, we will have nowhere to say mass. And the Protestant church stepped forward and said, you will say mass in our church. So for all that period of building, mass was in the Protestant church. And he saw this as a sign of something good coming from all of this. Sorry, this is a cemetery. <laughs> and sadly, it's not a very happy place. But uh, that's a little about poor, poor, uh, poor William Daniels. <laughs> Now, a slightly It's over this Stole my shoe. So just to tell you a little bit very quickly about the, the, uh, the new church. So the new church, right, um, was built in 1826 and it was designed by a man called John Semple from Dublin, an architect who designed many, many churches of the time in Dublin. Um, and uh, when it was, uh, now part of the, the building works was to restore the tower, which was now a ruin. So they restored the, the tower, and that's why it's in quite good condition, uh, to use as the sacristy for the church. Now, when the, build, the church was built, the parishioners didn't like it. And the reason why they didn't like it were two reasons. One was they had to pay for it. <laughs> and the other one was that they said it was too spiky. <laughs> now, we looked at that and we said, too spiky? What do they mean, too spiky? And uh, the answer is that at the time, um, the parishioners would have been what is referred to as low church. And they saw this as Catholic architecture. Mm -hmm. And that's why they weren't comfortable with it. Okay. Right? Now you would ask, well, when they were picking the architect, why didn't they tell him they wanted low church architecture? We, we don't know, but that's... That's what happened, and this sure enough, high, this is high church architecture. This is high church at the time, yeah. at the time, yes. Yeah. And and if you went to other places in Ireland, you'd find a lot of churches that are very like that. But anyway, um, there it stood, and it served as uh, as a church, and until 1950. Now, 1950, uh, if you had a building anywhere with a roof, you had to pay tax. And the congregation had dwindled considerably, and they couldn't afford to pay the rates on the roof. So there was a lot of uh, arguing and talking and discussing, and eventually, sadly, the decision was to take the roof off the church, uh, which was a great pity and probably wouldn't happen now, but, uh, but there it is. And um, it happened in 1950. But a lot of, a lot of things have happened. Uh, that are very different over the 50 years, probably more than any other 50 years. Um, a, man, a lady was here recently, an elderly lady, and she said that her mother worked in a solicitor's office, just literally down, down there, where that sort of copper roof building is. 
in, in the 1940s. And um, uh, the solicitor was invited to a wedding here in this a Protestant church in the 1940s. And he said to the ladies in his office, it's on next Friday, and if you like, you can put your pens down. You can go and visit the church and see the flowers uh, that have been put there for the wedding. So duly on Friday, the ladies put their pens down, came up the street, into the church, and admired all the flowers. And that was Friday. On Saturday, those ladies, because they were Catholic, went, no, I was going to point to the, to the spire of the Catholic Church, but it's, it's over there. They went to the Catholic Church and confessed that they had been in the Protestant Church, right? Now that's 1940. A lot has changed. Pretty good. Patrick Simple was born there, was the uh, Protestant rector. He wrote the book that the, the rector who wouldn't pray for rain. Oh, right. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. He, was, he was born in Brexit. Yeah. yeah. Sample. Yeah. Sample. Yeah. Which yeah. I think is the same name as the architecture. Department. Yes, he was John. That's not actually yeah. Patrick. Yeah. No, he was yeah. I, must, I must follow that one up. So anyway, that's, that's the church. So over here, lastly, Now this, this uh, headstone here belongs to a lady called Catherine Durfus McGee. <clears throat> Her husband was a customs officer in a place called Dundalk, which is north of Dublin. And in the 1830s, he, uh, he got a promotion and he was transferred to Wexford. So being the 1830s, he booked passage on the coach and four uh, for his wife and children and they headed down to Dublin and Wexford and on the way down there was a traffic accident and the coach overturned and Mrs. McGee was badly injured. Now she made it as far as Wexford but subsequently died from her injuries and she's buried here as, as is her husband a long time after that, right? And her children are mentioned here as well. Now, one of her children, a man called Thomas Darcy McGee, was a right young man, and he got involved, we spoke over there about the rising in 1798. Well, this Thomas got involved in the next one, which wasn't any more successful than the previous one, but that's not, that's neither here nor there. But anyway, Thomas got involved and it failed, the United Ireland, Revolution, and he had to leave the country, and he went to America, and where he That'd did a lot. Robert Ennis. It could be. Yes. And he meant he uh, did as much as he could to help immigrants coming into United States from not only Ireland but other countries as well. Uh, he fell foul of the authorities over there and had to move north into what we know as modern-day Canada. Now, he did more of the same work on behalf of the, of the immigrants and then he got involved in politics in Canada, which was you know, only beginning at that stage. And to cut a long story short, he ended up being a member of the first government in Canada. Yeah. And he was Minister for Agriculture and Immigration. And um, as a result of being uh, a government minister in a sovereign nation he was able to come back to Ireland he was no longer on the run and visit his mother's grave and she had a very simple grave at the time so he had money in his pocket and he was able to pay for a much nicer headstone now this is not the headstone this is the one after Thomas Darcy McGee's headstone anyway I should tell you that while he was here in Wexford doing good things for his mother, 
um, he was invited to speak in the art centre, which would have been the old town hall. And he spoke to a big number of people and talked about his experiences and uh, suggested that perhaps now he was an older man in his 40s, that he thought perhaps um, armed revolution was not the solution, that there were other ways of doing it, right? Anyway, he went back to Canada and he was assassinated outside his front door. And a man was arrested and hanged, the last public hanging in Canada. Some say the man was guilty, uh, others say that it may have been the long arm of the Fenians who were uncomfortable with what he was saying back in Wexford, because they obviously didn't agree with that. Uh, but one way or another, the poor man was assassinated and he was only in his 40s. So uh, here, it's, here they lie, and back about 50 years ago, a man who used to come and visit the cemetery, cemetery here and bring people around the town was very concerned that the headstone was broken and smashed and that really it was a shame and something should be done. So he decided to write to Monsieur Trudeau, old, the older senior Prime Minister of Canada, mm -hmm. and tell him that this was a shame because this was the mother of one of the founders of their nation and they really should do something about it. And uh, he didn't get an answer from Mr. Trudeau. So he wrote a second letter and he said he was very sorry that his first letter hadn't arrived, maybe perhaps he got the address <laughs> wrong and giving all sorts of excuses and uh, no answer to the second letter. So he was getting a bit cross at this stage so he decided to write a third letter you know, and say, look, he was amazed that a man who could run a country the size of Canada, you know, couldn't even get around to open his post <laughs> and obviously Mr. Trudeau didn't <coughs> like that letter because he acted upon it and as we are reliably informed by the embassy in Dublin and instructions went to the Canadian embassy in Dublin to go down and do something Sorry. about it. So they did and this is it and the Canadian government paid for this headstone. Yeah. Uh, sadly the man who wrote the letters died and he didn't get credit for writing the Prime Minister of Canada, but but he does he does he really talk about it. <laughs> so that's and if you go to Ottawa, um, I, I believe if you go to Ottawa, uh, opposite the state buildings, there is a big pub called the Thomas Darcy Museum. There is. Yeah. Yeah. There you are. And that's the proof. Of it. There you go. So there we are. Thank you for coming. I oh, hope I haven't bored you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No. Very good.